Soda Spills, Young Poo, and Death by Donut. Plus, This Day in History with FDR Dies and our Song of the Day by Ride on Your Morning Monarchy for April 12th, 2017. I'm James Evan Pilato from MediaMonarchy.com. Welcome to another listener-supported blast of fear-free news brought to you by you. A couple seconds after 9 a.m. coming to you, as always, from the Media Monarchy Studios up here in the Best West Coast. We call it Peak Portland. I hope you're doing well, safe and sound, whenever, wherever you are. We love it when you listen live, 9 a.m. Pacific Time, MediaMonarchy.com slash listen Monday through Friday for your morning monarchy. And, of course, we follow it up two hours after that with your daily DJ set at noon. Two live hours each and every weekday brought to you by you. And we are simulcast, as always, by our amazing friends and growing community at RadioConfluence.com, and also a huge thanks to the Truth Seeker app for carrying this show. But the biggest, bestest thanks go to our supporters and subscribers. MediaMonarchy.com slash support is the place to go for the Bitcoin, the snail mail, the PayPal, and the Patreon address. And a huge thanks to our newest patrons, like John C. Huge thanks to him, and huge thanks to Victoria N. She bumped up her Patreon pledge. I've mentioned this a couple of times before. It's way, way easy on Patreon to raise or lower your pledge as your ability might raise or lower. PayPal pretty much monkeyed with all their stuff. And if you signed up months ago or even years ago to give us that regular support via PayPal, that all still works great. However, if you never did, it's actually really difficult to sign up and make a regular monthly donation via PayPal. If you can remember to do it, that's fantastic. But I'd like to point you to patreon.com slash media monarchy. It might be a heck of a lot easier. And as I say, if you can give a little, I can give a lot. I sure can't seem to be able to bust out that newsletter yet. Subscribers, of course, get the subscribers only newsletter. We've been doing those since the start of 2017. Of course, as you might know, things are a little cattywampus and all up in the air. My wife was out of town for the better part of February and March, so there's a lot of catching up at home to do. Of course, as we've noted all this week on the show, spending time with your family and friends is probably more important than making that extra blog post. So it is Wednesday, and Wednesday is food, health, and environment news. We call it Food World Order. That was a phrase I coined on air many, many moons ago. And have been using it ever since. Each day of your morning monarchy, we focus in on a different area of the news. Monday's world news, geopolitics. Tuesday's tech, we call cyberspace war. Wednesday is food world order. Tomorrow, some of your weirdos' favorite show. We call it holy hexes. That is your occult, chaotic, conspiratorial craziness. And I see why you dig it. Sometimes my most favorite day as well. It's just the most unfiltered episodes. And then Friday, you know, the day that movies and music come out. It's Media Memes Day, the entertainment industrial complex. We've also got new action from the Corbett Report I'll talk about at the end of this episode, and it's very appropriate to our Wednesday Food World Order edition. So we got a delicious, nutritious menu for you. Let's glance at the breaking lamestream news. Trump diminishes but does not dismiss Bannon. Of course, they removed him from the National Security Council. Meanwhile, big old Chris Christie says ex-Trump aide Carter Page deserves the presumption of innocence on Russia. Melania Trump wins damages and an apology from Daily Mail publisher. We always find the media law angles, of course, interesting. We did go to school for that just a, just a little bit. Hey, that China pivot those crazy guys at NewsBud we're talking about seems to have pretty much paced out, right? China Xi calls Trump and urges a peaceful approach to North Korea. The United Airlines debacle rages on. And we'll talk about an interesting debacle. We'll talk about a sort of pop culture made debacle of this past week that fits into our Food World Order news. And it does actually, (laughs) it does have to do with horrible soda drinks that, like I've said, it's not a lot of excuses to not know where your dollar's going in a lot of ways. When it comes to what you cram down your gullet, you've got the ability to find out what's in that and who makes it and who's making money off of it and what it's doing to you. I think I've often mentioned I was able to finally kick the soda demon, and I was never hugely addicted to it. It was just one of those little regular small things you had as part of your day, and of course I did lots of restaurant jobs back in the day. What do you get at restaurant jobs? All the soda you can drink. They don't care, and that should always kind of tell you something. Why the bosses don't care how much soda I drink? Aren't I costing them lots of money? No, you are not. Because if anybody knows, and I'm sure some of you do, 
how the soda comes in. It comes in in this heavy-ass, really thickly walled box. And inside, there's a sack filled with super syrupy, highly concentrated soda. And then you hook that up to the line, and then you put the CO2 and the stuff in it, and that's how when it comes out of the fountain, it should be all nice and bubbly and right. You know, like if the tapped beer is done well, it should be a very fresh beverage for you. But it's all profit. It's pretty much like the movie theater I used to work at. The little art house, one screen theater in West Virginia called the, op- the Shepherd Sound Opera House. It's one of the oldest movie theaters in America. It was one of the first to make the switch to talkies. But Rusty always joked that he was just in the popcorn business. He's like, yeah, the movies, you know, I don't make any money off of that. But after I sell one popcorn, it's all profit after that. So you realize as a kid when you're working in all those restaurants, oh, that's right, they don't care if I drink soda because it doesn't cost them a thing. It's just all money, money, money. Some 7,200 gallons, that's 7,200 gallons of concentrated Mountain Dew syrup created a huge foaming event and generated environmental concerns after it went down the drain, literally, at the Pepsi bottling plant on Mason Road in Howell last month. That's Michigan. The Michigan Department of Environmental Quality, the DEQ, was at the plant on several occasions after a tank ruptured and sent the syrup through a floor drain and into the plant's internal sewer system back on March 10th, said DEQ Senior Environmental Quality Analyst Carla Davidson. A spill of this magnitude is highly unusual, Davidson said, noting the high sugar syrup can have a toxic effect on aquatic aquatic life if it ends up in rivers, lakes, or streams. Most of the spill was contained in PepsiCo, and city officials said proper procedures were used following the spill. Davidson disagreed. They could have chosen to isolate Davidson said, noting she did not visit the scene until later, so information about the initial chain of events came from reports submitted by PepsiCo and compiled later by DEQ staff. They have an equalization basin. They knew there was a spill, and they could have tried to isolate it, then have that wastewater hauled away to protect the integrity of their pre-treatment system. That's what normally we would recommend during a spill event like that. Davidson said plant management attempted to treat the problem without outside intervention for two days until the system became overwhelmed. The DEQ received a call to its pollution emergency alert system line. I shouldn't laugh, but it should have just become so obvious. No, this is totally safe to drink. Oh yeah, fluoride, all that stuff is great, except when they spill and they go into freak out hazmat mode. Should probably tell you something. Remember all those little projects you did as a kid? Oh, watch the soda dissolve this penny. Not to mention what it's going to do to your pipes. So another classic story of they hid it and lied about it. It's always the cover-up. Is that the governor of Alabama just recently arrested and resigned? And it's not because he was hooking up with an, you know, with an employee. It's because he lied and tried to cover up the fact that he was hooking up with an employee. It's not the crime that tends to get you. It's almost always the cover-up. That doesn't take away from the crimes. But they're calling, of course, Mountain Dew and all these other grody soda things. Royal Slurm. You're listening to The Morning Monarchy for Wednesday, April 12th, 2017. I'm James Evan Pilato from MediaMonarchy.com. Look at what's going down your gullet. And there's also a global glut. Iowa farmer Carl Fox is drowning in corn. So we go from drowning in soda to drowning in corn. Reluctant to sell his harvest at today's rock-bottom prices, he has stuffed storage bins at his property full and left more corn piled on the ground covered with a tarp. He'd rather risk potential crop damage from the elements than pay the exorbitant cost of storage elsewhere. That's how poor people do it, said Fox, who's been farming for 28 years. You do what you have to do. Farmers face similar problems across the globe. World stockpiles of corn and wheat are at record highs. From Iowa to China, years of bumper crops and low prices have overwhelmed storage capacity for basic foodstuffs. Global stocks of corn, wheat, rice, and soybeans combined will hit a record 671.1 million metric tons going into the next harvest, the third straight year of historically high surplus, according to the USDA, which we're going to talk about them in just a few minutes, in their new heads. 
that 671 million metric tons is enough to cover demand from China for about a year. In the United States, farmers facing a fourth straight year of declining incomes and rising debts are hanging on to grain in the hope of higher prices later. They may be waiting a long time. Market fundamentals appear to be weakening as the world's top grain producers ponder what to do with so much food. The persistent glut is a striking contrast from the panic a decade ago when severe droughts in Russia and the U.S. sent prices soaring. The shrinking supply forced big importers such as China to enact policies to encourage more domestic production and increase the volume of storage to improve food security. China abandoned that policy last year and is now selling off hundreds of millions of tons of old stocks. Russia, too, is looking at exporting from state-held stockpiles with storage stuffed after a record harvest in 2016. A surge of Chinese and Russian exports would put even more downward pressure on prices in an oversupplied global market. That means U.S. farmers will likely be producing more grain for less money. The USDA forecast net farm income will fall 8.7% this year to $62.3 billion, the lowest level since 2009. So let's go back a few sentences. The persistent glut is a striking contrast from the panic a decade ago when severe droughts in Russia and the United States sent prices soaring. The shrinking supply forced big importers such as China to enact policies to encourage more domestic production. So much of what we do, we're doing for other countries. God, well, well, what would China think? We had some old Simpsons on just the other day, and I believe it's when I think Bart gets a license, and then he's using it to drive a tractor. And he's going through his tasks of the day, and he basically, you know, gasses up the tractor, makes sure the animals are fed, and then endorses the check for all the corn he didn't grow. Grains piled on runways, parking lots, fields amid global glut. This article is on the St. Louis Post-Dispatch and goes on and on to talk about our glut. Now, do we thank our, our fine friends at, for all that GMO food? They've really solved, solved the hunger problems, right? As we see, it generally comes down to distribution. Whether you're talking about media or whether you're talking about food. Massive international multinational factory farms, yeah, not an efficient way to feed people. Meanwhile, famines worldwide. And meanwhile, in Wisconsin, as we've recently talked about, they've got time to ban butter. In February, we talked about it. People were surprised to find out that selling Kerrygold butter, a line of butter produced in Ireland, is a criminal offense in Washington. It was interesting, then then Ireland found out about it. Under a 1970 law, all butter sold in the state must be subjected to scrutiny by a panel which recently ruled Kerrygold was not compliant. Their problem with Kerrygold's product was that the cattle who produce the milk for the cheese and the butter are grass-fed, something the panel ruled was against state law. Any shopkeepers who continue to stock the brand face a $1,000 fine and up to six months in jail, something, of course, that has enraged consumers. In response, Wisconsin consumers, of course, have taken to traveling across state lines to buy Kerrygold butter in Illinois. In March, a group of Wisconsin citizens took to the courts in hopes of gaining the freedom. Please, government, give me that freedom that was never yours to take in the first place. They'd like the freedom to freely buy whatever butter they want. Tired of trekking across state lines to stock up, Gene Smith and a handful of other Wisconsin butter aficionados filed a lawsuit challenging the law, saying local consumers and businesses are more than capable of determining whether butter is sufficiently creamy, properly salted, or too crumbly. No government help needed. While the matter of butter may seem small, there are three valuable lessons we can learn from Wisconsin's war on foreign butter. Moreover, all these lessons apply well beyond the world of dairy products. Now, we're grabbing this from Mises.org, and again, everything we say and play will always be included in the show notes. We actually publish the stories we are going to talk about at least an hour before showtime. So if you're listening live, you can follow those stories and see the links and see where we're going. If you're listening later, of course, everything is in the show notes. All the articles, all the videos, all the research you can continue to do. Lesson the first, public safety is really just about government favors for special interests. In cases like these, it's routine for state officials to claim that the law has something to do with public safety. 
More savvy consumers, of course, immediately suspected that the wall isn't about safety at all, but it's about protecting Wisconsin dairies from consumers. And they're right to be suspicious. The Wisconsin agency that implements the effective ban on Kerrygold butter is called the Wisconsin Department of Agriculture, Trade, and Consumer Protection. But given the power of the dairy lobby in Wisconsin, one would have to be extremely naive to assume that it's mere coincidence that Wisconsin is the only state in America to enact such stringent butter laws. Even saying stringent butter laws, it sounds hilarious. (laughs) So that's lesson the first. It's generally for their homies and special interests. Grease in the palms, and, and we'll get to that here in just a moment as well. Lesson the second, decentralization equals freedom. Fortunately for the residents of Wisconsin, the laws of Wisconsin on this matter only extend to the state line. Once outside the state, consumers can purchase a wider array of dairy products. Imagine, however, dig, if you will, a picture If the Wisconsin ban were a matter of national policy, or worse yet, imposed by international agreements like the TPP or NAFTA, once nationalized or internationalized, escape from the whims of special interest groups would be nearly impossible for most people. Instead of merely traveling an hour or two over state lines, purchasing the product one prefers would become a matter of international intrigue. And lesson third, free trade benefits everyone except the crony capitalists. Although the Wisconsin regulations on butter are not technically a tariff, they have the effect of a tariff because the burden of the regulations tend to fall disproportionately on foreign foods. Moreover, if the defenders of the status quo were honest with the public, they would just come out and admit that, yes, the law exists to protect local dairy producers from outside competition. That's Wisconsin's war on foreign butter. We talked about that back in February when that story was breaking. We played those news clips for you about people who needed that butter to put in their coffee. You're listening to The Morning Monarchy for Wednesday, April 12th, 2017. I'm still James Evan Pilato from MediaMonarchy.com. I don't know exactly the specifics of Sonny Purdue's confirmation. I think it's pretty much all a set deal. But then, of course, all our Congress critters went on vacation. And during all of that, they are more obsessed with Supreme Court nominee Neil Gore, such as fate. But Sonny Perdue, former governor of Virginia, is pretty much going to be our new agriculture secretary. And so we've got the article from Food Safety News. Senate fiddles as rural America burns waiting for ag secretary. Food Safety News, of course, huge, huge fans of massive intervention, and they never found a government boondoggle they didn't like. But as we always note, I think it's important to go to the sort of horses' mouths when you want to look at stories in specific areas. That's why when we're talking about advertising and commercials in that world, we go to Ad Age, we go to Ad Week. If we're talking about crazy military weapons, that's why we would go to places like Danger Room and Wired and Defense Talk. They love that shit. You go to those places and you're going to find the more sort of unfiltered version. Meanwhile, this just in from the chat. Clarified butter is the shit. (laughs) I believe my grandmother used to make that. And, you know, and these are the things we've been losing. God, you imagine it. She's just to remember kind of how tough as nails our grandparents were. Now, as we were talking recently, we all have these little pansy hands that can't really do anything. I can push little buttons, though. So I made reference to it a little bit yesterday when I noted that David Perdue, current Georgia senator and also current brother to our future ag secretary, Sonny Perdue. Now, they claim no connection, family relations whatsoever to the massive Purdue chicken industrial complex. You know, they just have the exact same last name and work in the exact same areas and come from the exact same place in the country. So last week when we played all those clips of everybody kissing Sonny Purdue's ass and telling him how beautiful your family is and so, so blessed and I'll avert my gaze while you come here and we appoint you to our new agriculture head as you're following in the fine footsteps of former Monsanto creatures like Tom Vilsack. I played all those clips, and (laughs) I think we basically lost a listener because they apparently love Sonny Perdue. And I was told they kissed his ass because he's a good, honest man. 
Like, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean to insult your favorite politician. But as, you know, Doug Sanhope kind of joked, this is the start of all his sets, you know, he kind of feels like he's leading people into battle. You're not all going to be here when we're done. They kissed Sonny Purdue's ass because he's a good, honest man, a now former listener from Georgia said during a morning monarchy a couple weeks ago. Now, what I would probably prefer is the tweet or whatever that says, hey, you know, he's actually done some good stuff, this or that. And I would imagine it probably comes down to some family connection where maybe the Purdue's and their connected people did something nice and personal. And of course, I'm from West Virginia. That shit happens all the time. Nepotism is somehow the way things get done in smaller places. Hope that's not a big news flash and breaking news for you. But it, all it made me do is go, well, hell, maybe, maybe I'm wrong about this guy. Maybe I should look into him himself. Maybe I should just start by going to Sonny Purdue's Wikipedia page. And then I click down to... Alleged conflicts of interest. Oh, actually, hold, hold on. I don't want to get into Sonny Purdue's alleged conflicts of interest first, because first we want to talk about praying for rain. On November 13th, 2007, while Georgia suffered from one of the worst droughts in several decades, Sonny Purdue, the governor, led a group of several hundred people in a prayer on the steps of the state capitol. Purdue addressed the crowd saying, We've come together here simply for one reason and one reason only, to very reverently and respectfully pray up a storm. God, we need you. We need rain. During his governorship, the Georgia State Ethics Commission received 13 complaints against Purdue. The State Ethics Commission ruled against Purdue twice, finding that Purdue had taken improper campaign contributions, including donors like SunTrust Banks, and that he had improperly used one of his family business's airplanes on a campaign for which the commission unusually fined the sitting governor. What did the State Ethics Commission get for that? The executive secretary was fired. In January 2003, Purdue signed an executive order prohibiting himself and all other state employees from receiving any gift more, worth more than 25 bucks. During his governorship, Purdue collected at least 25,000 bucks worth of gifts, including sporting event tickets and airplane flights. Unlike previous governors, Purdue did not put his assets into a blind trust once elected. Does that sound familiar? In mid-2003, Georgia Governor Sonny Perdue purchased 101 acres of land next to his Houston County, Georgia home. The land was adjacent to the 20,000-acre Oakey Woods Preserve being sold by Weyerhaeuser of the paper industrial complex. The land was eventually sold to developers. However, the state was evaluating bidding on the property and keeping it as a reserve. After the state dropped out of the bidding and the land was sold to developers, the value of Perdue's property more than doubled. Purdue failed to disclose his ownership of the property in required financial disclosure forms. In December 2004, Purdue bought $2 million worth of land near Disney World from a developer whom he had appointed to the state's Economic Development Board. Late in the evening of March 29, 2005, the penultimate day, that's next to last, of the legislative session, Representative Larry O'Neill, who also worked part-time as Purdue's personal lawyer, introduced legislation making capital gains tax owed on Georgia land sales deferrable if the income goes to purchase out-of-state land, also unusually making the tax break retroactive. Purdue signed the legislation into law on April 12, 2005, three days before tax day. That'd be 12 years ago today, and yet again, here we are, three days before taxation is theft day. Don't forget to file your thefts. Purdue then used that new law on his 2004 tax return to defer $100,000 in taxable gains from the sale of the land. In 2007, Purdue convinced a skeptical legislature to approve $19 million fishing tourism program he called Go Fish Georgia. Purdue then decided that the Go Fish Education Center would be built down the road from his home. During meetings with Georgia state port officials, then-Governor Purdue discussed his family business's use of a terminal, then started a new export company in Savannah soon after leaving office. That's just a brief look at former Georgia governor, now soon-to-be new Secretary of the Department of Agriculture, Sonny Purdue. Just a quick look at some of his conflicts of interest. Sorry if we insulted your favorite politician, but they're pretty much 
not saints. You're still listening, as long as I haven't pissed you off, <laughs> into the morning monarchy. I'm James Evan Pilato for MediaMonarchy.com. The tasteless Pepsi commercial. We've been including food world order news from Marion Nestle with the unfortunate and hilarious last name. And, of course, I would recall what I just said about the Purdue's. She says she's not related to the massive Nestle Corporation. And it doesn't seem like she would be because she pretty much drops food truth bombs. Food politics. We've been including alongside our food safety news tweets under hashtag food world order. Much ink has been spilled and many pixels displayed over Pepsi's Kendall Jenner commercial. Now polled with an apology from the company. Now we'll include the link... And somebody actually has the full 2 minute 39 second commercial. I don't know if you know this. Generally, when they're making ads, they make the long version and then they make the minute version and then they make the 30 second version that they can kind of run in all the different formats and different spots for you. Now, of course, in the world of YouTube, they can also put up, oh, here's the big whole thing. <laughs> yeah, they're showing the Pepsi commercial on United Flights exclusively now, I think. So in case you missed this, and you're probably lucky if you did, here's just some of the breakdown. And this post from Mary Nestle basically gives some of the highs and lows. WPXI Pittsburgh notes that Bernice King, of course, Martin Luther King relative, criticizes Pepsi in, their, in a pointed tweet. The Huffington Post gets into three mistakes Pepsi made that entrepreneurs should avoid. Slate Magazine notes that video director, commercial director, Beck Bennett, has the conversation everyone involved in Pepsi's bad ad somehow avoided? Does that even make sense grammatically? I'm not sure. The Christian Post asks, is Pepsi Kendall Jenner ad really racist? Pepsi solves racism. Protester tries Kendall Jenner's Pepsi. Oh, no, this, this is even better. We're kind of getting, getting, getting ahead of ourselves. Terrible soda company Pepsi released this ridiculous commercial showing Kendall Jenner, who I think is one of those goobers that's famous for being famous, of the Kardashian industrial complex. She's up in some tower and she basically sees these protests building. And so she joins the protests and takes off her black wig and smears off her lipstick because she's getting real. And she goes down and joins the protests. And then she hands Pepsi's to the pigs and everybody freaks out about it of course the fantastic saturday night live had the last word on it because they're they're so cutting their parody so broad on the nose i believe you would call it and the washington compost asks how did that ad even get made i guess the interesting part that we would take from our standpoint here. It was, I suppose, a, a big, giant WTF. I guess, no, that's not right. It would be a WGAF. Who gives a fuck? Only people who still drink Pepsi Poison watch the ridiculous brainwashing television and know who all these ridiculous celebrities are and that much more give a shit about what they say or think or do or drink. Pepsi, Kendall Jenner, Saturday Night Live, this is another perfect example of us being given our heroes and villains. Hey, guess what? I don't drink that garbage. I don't take part in your stupid, ridiculous left-right paradigm protests. And then I don't watch phony outrage about it on a horrible corporate comedy show. So kind of past all of these things. So I guess in some ways I'm surprised at the outrage. But I have the problem of sometimes putting too much hope in things. <laughs> and that's, you know, again, from the same company that set Michael Jackson on fire. That's right. You're listening to the Morning Monarchy Food World Order Edition. I'm James Evan Pilato for MediaMonarchy.com. Police in Manchester, UK, battling an epidemic of the use of spice. Attended nearly 60 incidents related to the drug in the city center in one weekend. Our buddy Darren, Daz Alt Theory on the tweets. He had sent me some photos. 
It basically showed a bunch of people all just stumbling around, falling around, looking like zombies. And as The Guardian says, authorities in the city have reported a surge in the use of the synthetic cannabinoid, which is said to induce a zombie-like state. And you can see from the photos that it pretty well does that. But where does the problem come? The problem comes in when you try and ban it. A ban on the supply and production, but not the possession of spice and other novel psychoactive substances, came into force with the Psychoactive Substances Act of 2016. The drug was previously legal and available to buy in shops and online. Greater Manchester Police imposed a 48-hour dispersal order on the city center on Friday and Saturday, launching special patrols and making scores of arrests to remove anyone suspected of taking or supplying the drug. The force said there were 58 spice-related incidents in the center of the city on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, resulting in eight arrests. The three days also saw 23 incidents to which an ambulance was called and 18 dispersal orders or directions to leave issued. 51 arrests have been made in the past three weeks as part of Operation Mandara, the police crackdown on supply of the drug. M-A-N-D-E-R-A. I'm not sure if there's interesting Twilight language in that name game. Operation Mandara. Most of the incidents were in the Piccadilly area of the city center, described as a dystopian nightmare by the Manchester Evening News, which serves as a transit, or rather transport and shopping hub. The use of spice can cause hallucinations, psychosis, muscle weakness, and paranoia. Videos of users have gone viral, so to speak, with some shown twitching or in a catatonic state. When the drug first appeared in the UK, it was often described as having effects similar to those of cannabis. Yeah, because I twitch and go into a catatonic zombie-like state when I smoke weed. Right. But the experts have described such a comparison as dangerous as the effects of spice are much more extreme and unpredictable. I gotta say it. The spice is life. I don't have any of the horrific photos of that, but you can find those easily. And it's not unlike the pictures we've seen here in the States of people overdosing on opioids all laying in their car, jacked out. Poor baby in there. And of course, those are fantastic, you know, heart string, heart tug, heart string tugging photos. You got to wonder when you're allowed to see those, why you're allowed to see those, why they get pushed at certain times. As we've unfortunately joked, yes, yeah, somehow the horrible images of Syria just weren't able to come out from the, you know, the Washington Post and CNN in the previous eight years. But now I guess that embargo has been lifted. They want you to see those photos because they want the reaction. The real action, as they always say, is in the reaction. Like the kind you'd have if you found a dead bat in a bag of salad mix. The Federal Centers for Disease Control and Prevention late Saturday said it received a dead bat from a consumer who claimed it was found in a packaged salad mix, sparking an investigation that's prompted the Atlanta-based agency to recommend a post-exposure rabies treatment for two people. The CDC said the deteriorated condition of the dead bat did not permit it to definitely rule out that the bat had rabies. The dead bat is alleged to have been found in a bag of Fresh Express Organic Market Side Spring Mix. The CDC said the risk of rabies transmission was extremely low but could not be worn, ruled out. It therefore recommended the two people who ate the salad mix get the post-exposure rabies treatment as a necessary precaution. Neither of the individuals showed any signs of rabies. The salad mix were sold by Walmart stores in Alabama, Florida, Georgia, Louisiana, Mississippi, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Virginia. Fresh Express has recalled the product, and you can get the actual production codes in this article. Upon receiving notification, both Walmart and Fresh Express food safety and rapid response teams, in close coordination with regulatory authorities, acted immediately to review all the relevant records, launch an intensive investigation, and initiate product removal and recall procedures. There have been no other reports of animal matter. The Florida Department of Health, U.S. Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, and the CDC are all a part of the investigation into the dead bat. You look completely fine. Here, take this vaccine. It's like a 
horrific Cracker Jack prize, right? This is another, I would think, a great example of things not to buy. <laughs> Do you not know how to make salad mix yourself? Buy some romaine. Buy some watercress. Buy some spinach. You know, buy some leafy greens that you enjoy eating. And then you tear those up with your hand and throw them in a bowl. There. I solved your problem. That'll be $75, please. $75 being my hourly rate for, of course, the ridiculous things I don't get called to fix. Now, these are all coming from Walmart. These are all coming from the South. Walmart, I believe, as has been noted, they're the biggest sellers of organic foods. That's why we've been mostly successful in the food world order. I've said this a million times. Gosh, I you know, I stopped buying Raytheon missiles, but they just they just keep on making it. But if you stopped buying that food with high fructose corn syrup or GMOs, the companies all go, whoa, 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 wait, 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 we'll change it. We'll be organic. What do you want? We'll make it whatever you want. Just please keep buying it. Please keep supporting this outdated mode. So why would you buy that stuff? You're still listening to The Morning Monarchy. I'm still James Evan Pilato for MediaMonarchy.com. And Young Poo still makes aged fish live longer. It may not be the most appetizing way to extend life, but researchers have shown for the first time that older fish live longer after they've consumed microbes from the poo of younger fish. The findings were posted to the bio... RXIV.org preprint server on March 27th by a geneticist at the Max Planck Institute for Biology of Aging over in Cologne, Germany. So called young blood experiments that join the circulatory system of two rats, one young and the other old, have found that factors coursing through the veins of young rodents can improve the health and longevity of older animals. But the new, first-of-its-kind study examined the effects of transplanting gut microbiomes on longevity. The paper is quite stunning. It's very well done, says Heinrich Jasper, developmental biologist and geneticist at the Buck Institute for Research on Aging in Novato, California, who anticipates that scientists will test whether such microbiome transplants can extend lifespan in other animals. Life is fleeting for killfish. Oh, no, killifish. One of the shortest-lived vertebrates on Earth. The fish hits sexual maturity at three weeks old and dies within a few months. The turquoise killifish that Valenzano and his colleagues studied in the lab inhabits ephemeral ponds hmm, that form during rainy seasons in Mozambique and Zimbabwe. Previous studies have hinted at a link between the microbiome and aging in a range of animals. As they age, humans and mice tend to lose some of the diversity in their microbiomes, developing a more uniform community of gut microbes with once rare and pathogenic species rising to dominance in older individuals. The same pattern holds true in killifish, whose gut microbiomes at a young age are nearly as diverse as those of mice and humans. You can really tell whether a fish is young or old based on its gut microbiota. Now, I like the idea of where are we? Swimming around and... I like that phrase. Where'd it go? <clears throat> Ephemeral ponds. There it is. Good Lord. <laughs> it's like I, I just read it. Ephemeral ponds. That's uh, my new album coming out. So that's the article up on nature.com. Young poo makes aged fish live longer. The gut microbes of young killifish can extend the lifespans of older fish, hinting at the microbiome's role in aging. And this is where we all insert, oh, that's why the Simpsons always make those jokes. Constantly making jokes about Mr. Burns needing the blood of young people. There are multiple, multiple, multiple institutes, instances rather, of Mr. Burns, who, of course, is just sort of based on lots of different characters, so to speak. He is John D. Rockefeller. 
He is J.P. Morgan. He is Howard Hughes. He is William Randolph Hearst. He is all of those characters. And again, repeatedly throughout The Simpsons, lots of jokes about him needing the blood of young people. And it's not just in the weird Halloween episodes that, of course, aren't canon, as it were. So is that how David Rockefeller lived so long? Is that how Kissinger lived so long? No, he's not had seven heart transplants. But he might get some young blood. Are we on the cusp of the consumer biotech age when lab-grown meat will be just as common as farmed meat? Recently, a company called Memphis Meats started selling in vitro meat, IVM, that apparently tastes just like delicious chicken and duck. But if we want the price on an IVM burger to get below $1,000, we consumers need to buy lots of the stuff. That's why two Australian researchers from the University of Queensland decided to study what the U.S. public currently thinks about eating IVM in vitro meat. Psychologist Matty Wilkes and veterinary scientist Clive Phillips surveyed 673 people via Mechanical Turk, asking a wide range of questions about their backgrounds and attitudes towards meat eating. What they found is that roughly two-thirds of their subjects would be willing to try IVM and that a third thought it might become a regular part of their diets. Wilkes and Phillips suggest that this means people are open to eating IVM, but don't think it would replace farmed meat. Now, we've talked about lab-grown meat, and we've also been talking about the seemingly gigantic push to normalize cannibalism, and we'll have a little bit more on that, of course, on tomorrow's Holy Hexes edition. Trying to wrap up all our delicious, nutritious menus, and it ain't so delicious. Two things I didn't know. That Portland's Voodoo Donuts has a Denver location. The other thing I didn't know is that a guy died there the other day during a donut challenge. Travis Maloof, 42, died early Sunday of asphyxia due to obstruction of the airway, a coroner said. He had been participating in a contest to eat a donut the size of a small cake. Winners get the donut for free and a button saying they won the challenge, which Voodoo Donuts said it was suspending, according to a statement given to Denver news station KUSA-TV. Now, interestingly enough, I just had Titus Frost hit me up on Twitter the other day to be like, hey man, I'm looking into Voodoo Donuts and their connection possibly to Pizzagate, and you follow them? It's like, dude, they're a Portland institution. I followed them long before you existed and Pizzagate or any of this other stuff existed. I followed them because it's just, you know, a Portland thing you follow. They've been on the famous food shows, diners, dives, and drive-ins. And it's been one of those places that, of course, I was only here for a couple of months before my mom was like, Hey, have you gone to Voodoo Donut? My mom is quite the snack aficionado. <laughs> So there are at least two Voodoo Donut locations here in Portland. The one downtown is actually in a super sketch part of town and is pretty grody. They built another one in a much nicer part of town, and you will constantly see basically fat tourists carrying large pink boxes of donuts. They're fun. They're gimmicky. They've got ones with a bunch of cereal all over it. They put bacon on some of them. It's a very Portlandy thing, but after being here for over 12 years, it's very much meh. Previously on Brain Dead, uh, I mean, previously on Food World Order, state confirms nine rat lungworm cases. Researchers seek funding to combat the epidemic. A big spike. Researchers are calling it an epidemic. A big spike in the number of people infected with rat lung worm disease in Hawaii. The Department of Health says so far this year there are nine confirmed cases of the disease. Four are Maui residents, two are visitors, and three live on the Big Island. The Health Department is also looking into three possible cases on Maui and one on the Big Island. The disease is carried by rats, then spread through snails or slugs. Bridget Namata finds out what can be done to prevent the spread. Bridget? Joe, UH Hilo researchers tell me rat lung worm disease is preventable, but only if people are informed. That's why they're asking for more funding from the state to let people know about the dangers, as well as find out the most effective vegetable washes so people can continue to eat local and fresh produce safely. This is how the disease starts, a parasitic worm that invades the human brain. It's carried by rats, then spread through snails or slugs. 
The Department of Health says 11 cases were confirmed on the Big Island in 2016. That's like the million dollar question is why do all of these cases uh, originate on the east side of Hawaii? Professor Susan Jarvie was inspired to start research into rat lungworm disease after meeting Kay Howe, whose son Graham got the disease in 2008. I was in the hospital for four months and spent three of those months in a coma. Um, and he still has disabilities from this disease. Disabilities like vision issues, low energy, short-term memory loss, bladder, and balance problems. Both researchers want to create a safety campaign on the dangers of eating raw fruits and vegetables that haven't been properly washed. They believe the rise in cases is due to a semi-slug, an invasive species that spread from Big Island to now Maui, and call it an epidemic. I have been using that term for a long time, uh, but the Department of Health uh, d doesn't see it that way. Um, I, I think now with all the new cases on Maui, um, and an uh, increase in the number of cases uh, that we saw in 2016 here on the Big Island. I, I think it is an epidemic, and I think we have uh, a real, a real concerns about food safety. Produce gets shipped all around the world. You know, it is a global emerging disease, and we don't know if its range is going to expand. It's not just Hawaii, so we do need to um, be mindful of it. I'm told rat lung worm disease does not just affect humans. It also affects dogs and horses and can be fatal. Bridget Namata, KHON 2 News. Damn. Those dirty immigrant snails. Previously on Brain Dead. The surprising uptick has health officials and residents alike worried about the rise of the worm, which can invade the human brain. In infected people, the infection may be symptomless and resolve on its own. But for others, rat lungworm moves into the brain and can cause inflammation, pain, and other neurological problems such as tremors. In those cases, it can be fatal. In all cases, rat lungworm is very difficult to diagnose and there is no treatment. So the new LP coming out from Punk Man Rat Lungworm is called Ephemeral Ponds. And that's how we wrap up your Food World Order edition of your Morning Monarchy, my friends, except one extra bonus breaking bit. What is the secret of Soylent Green? Originally shot back on April 15th, 2013, nearly four years ago, my installment of film, literature, and the New World Order with our buddy James Corbett into Soylent Green. We look into the book, we look into the film, and we look at why Paul Ehrlich was involved. Huge thanks to Brock West for making a video, and it's over on the Corbett Report Extras. What is the secret of Soylent Green? A perfect addendum to your delicious, nutritious Food World Order menu this morning. And again, all these headlines we posted up in advance. We put them in a Twitter moment. And again, everything we say and play always included in the show notes. Legendary band Ride has reformed. And after 20-year break, they have a brand new record coming out. We've got their title track coming up in just a few minutes as your song of the day. But, of course, past is prologue. This day in history, April 12, 1927, Chiang Kai-shek orders the Communist Party of China members executed in Shanghai, ending the First United Front, the Shanghai Massacre of 1927. Hundreds killed, thousands missing. Now, you'll see this pop up on Twitter all the time. Hitler killed all kinds of Europeans, so that's the one we hear about. Other Russian czars killed even more millions of Africans. They, they don't have their own Holocaust industrial complex to talk about it all the time. Now again, don't try and pin me as some sort of denier or any of that stupid bullshit. I just like perspective. I just like subtext and context. April 12th, 1945. United States President Franklin Delano Roosevelt dies in office. Vice President and 33rd degree Freemason Harry Truman becomes the 33rd president upon FDR's death. Over the White House at Washington, the flag flies at half-staff as a grief-stricken nation mourns the death of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, President of the United States. Inside in the historic cabinet room, Vice President Harry S. Truman takes the oath of office as 32nd President 
administered by Chief Justice Harlan Fisk Stone. Mrs. Truman is at his side. President Truman asks the full Roosevelt cabinet to remain in office, expressing his intention to carry on American policies as formulated by the Roosevelt administration. There you have it. On this day, 33rd degree Freemason, Harry Truman becomes the 33rd president. Continuing to look at this day in history, April 12th, 1954, Bill Haley and the Comets recorded their song, Rock Around the Clock. The song would be released a year later in the movie Blackboard Jungle. Now, I was actually listening to Jamie Farr be interviewed on the Gilbert Gottfried Amazing Colossal Podcast, which for pop culture nerds is, is a fantastic listen. It was basically star Glenn Ford who got that song into Blackboard Jungle. He went to his kid, who he knew was into that new annoying rock and roll stuff you you got. Hey kid, what song should we put in the movie? And the kid says, oh my god, Rock Around the Clock from Bill Haley. April 12th, 1955, the polio vaccine developed by Dr. Jonas Salk is declared safe and effective. On this day in 1955, April 12th, 1961, Soviet cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin becomes the first human to travel into outer space and perform the first manned orbital flight on Vostok 1. I saw a fantastic Russian film several years ago as part of the Portland Film Festival all about Yuri. April 12, 1966, Jan Barry of Jan and Dean crashed his car on Dead Man's Curve in Beverly Hills. He suffered severe head injuries and was in a coma for two months. April 12, 1970, Soviet submarine K-8 carrying four nuclear torpedoes, sinks in the Bay of Biscay off France four days after a fire on board. April 12, 1988, Sonny Bono elected mayor of Palm Springs in California. And on this day, April 12, 1994, Hall's second album, but of course it was the massive introduction to everyone, Live Through This was released. Coming, of course, mere days after Kurt Cobain's death. An album which was... Pretty much ghostwritten by Billy Corgan and Kurt Cobain. <laughs> April 12th, 1999, United States President William Jefferson Clinton is cited for contempt of court for giving intentionally false statements in a civil lawsuit. He is later fined and disbarred. April 12th, 2000, Bo Diddley filed suit against the Swoostica for using his name and image without permission. Nike is accused of continuing to use his image after a contract expired in 1991. Now, posted to MediaMonarchy.com a decade ago today, three articles from April 12, 2007 on MediaMonarchy.com. UK government predicts a third of people will resist ID checks. One in three people will resist identity checks, according to government figures. This just-released statistic predicts a widespread revolt over identity cards. But the Home Office dismissed the figures as irrelevant. And now, ten, you know, ten years later, it seems rather irrelevant. There's no one resisting ID checks. They're willingly giving away every single bit of their personal information. The second posted to Media Monarchy a decade ago today, Israel almost shot down U.S. passenger jet. And the third and final posted to MediaMonarchy.com a decade ago today, Kurt Vonnegut, the creator of Rye science fiction and black comedy built on his experience as a World War II prisoner of war who survived the horrific Dresden bombing, died. Kurt Vonnegut, dead at the age of 84. Those and 11,000 plus more articles are in the archives at MediaMonarchy.com. We are monkeying with the theme and layout of the website. Hopefully everything is working along as well as it can. Of course, we can only do all this with your support. MediaMonarchy.com slash support. Been doing this for, uh, you know, for a while, since 9-11-05. Celebrating birthdays today as we wrap this episode up. April 12th, Billy Vaughn, Ann Miller, Tiny Tim, Herbie Hancock, Ed O'Neill, Tom Clancy, Dan Lauria, David Letterman, David Cassidy, Pat Travers, Andy Garcia, Vince Gill, Tama Janowitz, Portland's own Art Alex Zakis from Everclear, Indigo Girls' Amy Ray, St. Etienne's Sarah Cracknell, 90210's Shannon Doherty, and Homeland Propaganda's Claire Danes. All celebrating birthdays today. Some of those 
Man, I don't know if there's any musical folks that'll make their way into our daily DJ set at noon. Maybe Billy Vaughn. I got a 45 of his we might play. We always begin your daily DJ set at noon with vinyl, and it's an hour of amazing music. It's a little bit of a DJ, you know, in my other lives. Legendary shoegaze band Ride reformed in 2014 for a headlining sold-out tour. I caught them when they came through Portland here. After a 20-year break, Ride has returned with a new album, and we got the title track, Home is a Feeling, from the legendary shoegaze UK band Ride, wrapping up your morning monarchy for Wednesday, April 12th, 2017. I'm James Evan Pilato for MediaMonarchy.com again, thanking you so much for listening and thanking you so much for your support. And reminding you, as always, like Jello Biafra of the Dead Kennedy said, don't hate the media, become the media. Take care. You're listening to Media Monarchy with James Evan Filato. Since 2005, Media Monarchy has covered the real news about politics, health, technology, and the occult. All remixed with music and media that matters. Go to MediaMonarchy.com slash support and become a monthly subscriber so you can help keep independent, non-commercial, alternative media going and growing. Thanks.